agree that the example of dexamethasone for severely ill patients with COVID-19 um, was an example of something that went pretty well, pretty much according to plan. Randomized controlled trials were relatively easy to do. I'm not saying they, they, were, they were entirely straightforward, but you had your patients lying there in their beds uh, and you had an infrastructure uh, that could get these trials going. Dexamethasone, as we all know, a very tried and tested drug, uh, which was in the, in the drug box in the intensive care unit already. Uh, it wasn't a new drug. Um, the trials quickly produced definitive evidence, and that evidence was implemented literally overnight uh, and saved many lives. Now, here's another example to the right of the slide uh, of a different kind of science. It was contested science and there was tricky translation. There's a picture of President Trump uh, being offered a mask and saying he's not going to wear it. Um, masks, face coverings for the lay public for preventing the spread of COVID-19. There were no randomized controlled trials and maybe these were impossible. I know there's been a randomized controlled trial published last week uh, or the week before last, the Danmask uh, RCT, but it wasn't a trial of preventing the spread of COVID-19. It was a trial of protecting the wearer against COVID because a problem, of course, doing an RCT um, of me wearing a mask in order to protect you is that the person who signed the consent form is me. The person you know about is me. How are you going to test all the other people that I might infect? It's practically much more difficult. In fact, it may be logistically impossible. Anyway, whether it's impossible or not, no one's done one. Um, as we all know, masking very quickly became a political issue. Um, that wasn't what I expected when I, um, so I've got, this is going the wrong way. It wasn't what I expected uh, when I took this on. Um, but suddenly we, we the scientists, were uh, politicized. But let's go back to the dexamethasone example. And I'm going to craft this for you uh, as an example of uh, what we call evidence-based medicine, which for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to define as nice, clean experiments on well-defined population samples, which give us definitive findings that can be handed over to policymakers uh, who can then um, promote their implementation. And you may uh, have, you may be familiar with this triangle, which I got off Google Images. Um, there's lots of versions of it. But you can see that this is a hierarchy. It's called the hierarchy of evidence. And the argument from evidence-based medicine is that the red bit is what counts. The red bit is the good stuff. And all the others, as you go down through the rainbow with different study designs, are considered to be less good evidence. Uh, so uh, what, what is done in the systematic review is you look through the evidence and you chuck out the stuff that isn't a randomized controlled trial and then you look very carefully at uh, the randomized trials and you summarize those uh, and that's known as a, a systematic review. Now, sorry my slide moving on button is not good, yeah here we go. This is a screenshot from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine by coincidence, it's from my own department, but this is not a, um, a piece of work that I was directly involved with. And indeed, it's a piece of work that, that uh, I have publicly contested. Uh, but it was certainly some uh, um, group of scientists who had quite a lot of legitimacy uh, and credibility. Now, what these uh, two scientists, uh, Hennigan and Jefferson, did was they did a systematic review of uh, masks in the prevention of COVID. And you can see that they took the whole of the hierarchy of evidence, except the randomized controlled trials, and metaphorically at least, they chucked them in the bin. They, were, they, they deliberately and explicitly excluded all evidence that was not a randomized controlled trial, uh, leaving 14 trials on the use of masks versus no masks. And they said that evidence was disappointing, uh, it showed no uh, effect of masks, either in healthcare workers or in community settings. And so there, here began 
the uh, origins of a, of a big controversy, which I'm sure you've uh, been following, at least at some level. Now, one of the assumptions of evidence-based medicine, um, I've, I've actually depicted it in terms of this parrot. The parrot is not in the paper. The parrot is my metaphor. Uh, but th this is an, an interesting paper by a colleague of mine, Ivan Engebretson, and, and his colleagues uh, from the University of Oslo uh, in Norway. And what they say here is that uh, knowledge translation has some parallels with translation um, from one language to another. Uh, and they say that translation from one language to another is never done uh, by a bilingual parrot, uh, so to speak. Rather, it involves judgments and compromises and attention to different audiences, different contexts. I, at one point in my uh, career, I used to translate a, a medical journal from French into English. Uh, and I know exactly what they're saying here. You simply cannot translate directly. Uh, you have to think, now what's, what's my audience going to, how's it going to interpret this? Similarly, say Engelbretson and colleagues, translation of research evidence is not a simple act of summarizing and handing over facts rather it involves quite a lot of judgments and value-driven choices and that choice to say uh, we're going to categorize randomized trials as level one evidence and we're going to exclude all other evidence as poor quality is in itself a value judgment now drawing on uh, the critical linguist Jacques Derrida uh, Engelbretson and colleagues say this, the translational act itself is considered to be, uh, by the scientist, to be a non-act and the translator a non-actor. The purpose of translation is assumed to be a container of the original message without adding, transforming or otherwise betraying the original. And so the claim from evidence-based medicine is we have done something purely objective, purely scientific. We've had a good look and we found you the top facts and we've summarized those. And yet actually what's happening is there are many value-driven choices. Okay, so if that's my thesis, I'm now going to give you some examples. So here is a quote from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine website from April 2020, and I'm pretty sure it's still up there. It was last time I checked. Uh, and they said, as a sort of discussion section uh, around their systematic review, this wasn't based on the data that they collected. Uh, this was a, just a sort of a, a, a comment, if you like. They said that thinking you're protected means you may put yourself at higher risk. Um, in other words, the mask might lead to what we call risk compensation. Um, measures we can take, they said, instead of masking, uh, or, or that's the implication, can include washing hands, avoiding touching, social distancing, school posing, you know, all that kind of thing. We're, we're very familiar with these measures. Uh, and they said, you may also end up touching your face more often if wearing a mask. Finally, they said a mask can become dirty uh, and contaminated. Uh, so there were an awful lot of negative things said about masks. Uh, and this was followed within days from a statement uh, with a statement from Public Health England, uh, who said something very interesting. Uh, this is Jonathan Van Tam, and he said, we're following the science. Note the definite article, the science, the red triangle science. Um, while the practice of wearing masks, uh, he says, it seems wired into some Southeast Asian cultures, there's no evidence that general wearing of face masks by the public who are well affects the spread of disease in our society. So uh, the anthropologists among you might see this as an example of othering. Um, why? So the, the Asian uh, societies who've been very successful at controlling COVID uh, were seen to be people who had this weird cultural practice of wearing masks, which really wasn't evidence-based. It was just some funny thing they did, like they eat funny food and they bury their dead differently from, from us uh, and that kind of thing. Now, this same um, site on the Evidence-Based Medicine website was quoted um, by Scott Atlas, who at the time was the advisor to President Trump, uh, in uh, a tweet 
talking about uh, why Americans shouldn't be wearing masks despite the uncontrolled spread of COVID, and they are directly quoting Carl Hennigan and the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine. I actually heard just now that, that Scott Atlas has resigned today. I don't know why, uh, but this was highly, highly controversial. Actually, when the evidence was collected up around things like risk compensation and whether people touch their face less when wearing a mask, when someone actually went out and measured what was happening, uh, there's, a, there's a, a narrative review in the British Medical Journal came out in July. Um, risk compensation doesn't happen when you're wearing a mask. You're more likely to wash your hands. You're more likely to physically distance. Uh, it makes you more aware of other measures. Uh, and if you video people uh, going into a subway, say, and take a look at thousands and thousands of them using uh, computer imaging, you find that the ones who are wearing masks actually touch their faces less than the ones who are not wearing masks. So there never was any evidence for those claims. Okay, so what got left out? This is the really interesting stuff here, having thrown away everything that wasn't an RCT. Uh, and I don't want to give you this in any great detail because what I'm trying to look at is the social science of science. Um, what kinds of evidence were considered poor quality? Uh, and the first kind of evidence was these sneeze videos. How can that possibly be science? Look at it, just some woman sneezing. Uh, it doesn't look scientific. No idea why it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine or why it's been cited several hundred times. Uh, and, and likewise, choir stories. It was just a story, a case study. It was right down the bottom of that triangle in the, in the dark blue. Just a story. Uh, the fact that it was published in one of the top American journals, the fact that uh, that highly meticulous exploring of who had stacked chairs and who had touched which plate of food, uh, all that kind of thing. Um, it wasn't just an anecdote. Nevertheless, these kinds of stories on which a whole branch of aerosol science was being built um, had been metaphorically thrown in the bin um, by the assumption that only a randomized controlled trial could give us uh, worthwhile, uh, what was known as robust, rigorous evidence. Another kind of evidence that was metaphorically thrown in the bin uh, was the kind of natural experiments as to what had happened in particular countries uh, who had or had not introduced masks. So the orange and the blue lines are mortality rates over time in countries that had introduced uh, either mandated or widely taken up masking within uh, 30 days of the first case. And the red line is the countries that hadn't introduced masks uh, even by 100 days. Now you can say, oh yeah, but what about New Zealand? New Zealand didn't have masks, but it didn't have any country, it didn't have any cases or any deaths. Yeah, New Zealand is in the red line. New Zealand is one of those countries in the red. It's just an outlier. Uh, and likewise, there are countries that did introduce masking where they did have a fair few cases, and those are down there within the orange and the blue. But overall, uh, there was several orders of magnitude difference in uh, countries that introduce masking. Yes, they introduce other things and there's all sorts of modeling studies that have controlled for those. But the point I'm making is that this very dramatic difference uh, was simply put in, in the bin um, and said, well, it wasn't randomized, so we can't, we can't take account of it. So what we have here is two different perspectives on science. And I've given you two tweets here. Uh, I'm a great fan of Twitter. And these are two professors, um, both with similar training, they're both primary care actually. KK Cheng is professor of primary care and public health at the University of Birmingham. He's also Chinese as it happens. I'm, I'm not sure that that's entirely coincidental, but what he's advocating in this tweet is what I'm calling pragmatic public health. He is saying um, that he's talking about mechanistic evidence. For example, the sneeze videos, the, video, the, the analysis of, of what goes through a mask. In other words, laboratory studies and also these, these um, comparative cases of the different countries. He's also saying if masks caused any harm, then the countries where people wore them a lot would have more deaths. 
if they really contaminated you that much, surely, surely someone would have caught it and died of it. Uh, and so he's saying, look, this must show that they don't cause harm. And Paul Glasiew, who uh, was at the University of Oxford, is now at, at one of the universities in Australia, old friend of mine, as it happens, he's your traditional evidence-based medicine guy. Uh, as far as he's concerned, he's still very worried about it. Um, he's still talking about touching your mask, still talking about safety of removal and risk compensation. Uh, I don't think he's read the uh, paper that showed that risk compensation didn't occur, but this is fitting in with this, hang on, we have not got our definitive randomized controlled trial yet. Now, back in March, uh, some colleagues and I uh, wrote a piece, I think it was published just at the beginning of April, arguing for what we call the precautionary principle. We said, look, we don't have 100% proof yet, but let's err on the side of caution. And what we, uh, what we were doing was we were doing science in a complex system. And in complex systems, uh, things are characterized by uncertainty, uh, by contested science. We don't have definitive findings in complex systems. We have to work with incomplete ambiguous findings but what we were what we were looking at in march when we looked at what's happened in china and taiwan when we looked at the sneeze videos when we looked at the cruise ships uh when we looked at the choir stories we were saying this is pointing to um a likely conclusion that the virus is airborne and if it's airborne uh the only thing that's going to really control uh community spread apart from everyone staying in their houses, uh, is uh, widespread public masking. So that's what we argued. Uh, and it didn't change policy immediately. Um, I think it, this paper didn't change policy at all, but it may have contributed to it. But as you know, policy in the UK didn't change for another couple of months. Nevertheless, this paper um, went down differently in different circles. Um, here are two websites which were set up on the back of that article uh, explicitly to attack uh, my papers and also my character. And it's quite interesting because they're rather contrasting. So the first one is depicting me as a sort of um, a passionate campaigner um, and interfering with people's freedom, you know, um, trying to make these things mandatory, um, decimation of straw men arguments. Um, so, so I'm sort of depicted as crashing through with this, this thing that I'm absolutely sure that I was right about. The second article, interestingly, um, is criticizing me for the opposite. It's a, I think it's the same, the same article uh, is described as a nonsense paper. Uh, I'm described as the milk curdler. So if you want to look me up, there's a, quite a few uh, pieces on this website all about the milk curdler. Um, but, but his uh, problem, he, he, he doesn't give his name, but he, he calls himself Dr. No. He says the paper is larded with may this, and it seems likely that, and he, he doesn't like that sort of turgid prose. So his argument is I'm not sure enough that I'm right. I'm a little bit too circumspect. Anyway, so this, all, this sort of thing goes, goes up, but actually you will notice that they are not taking one sentence of what I'm saying and trying to give a scholarly riposte. It is, it is about this um, awkward academic who's got the wrong kind of personality uh, and is producing bad science, but they're not going to actually deconstruct that science. A few months back, I gave a talk uh, at this college. And the reason why I'm not looking in the chat today is that this was one of the comments posted in the chat even before I started. So I was talking about international differences in masking policies uh, and the asterisks I have added for your, um, for your edification. So it was, it was actually the full expletives uh, were put forward. And you can see, uh, first of all, I am denigrated as just a piece of excrement, but I'm also described as a sheep. I follow uncritically uh, they're not quite sure who I'm following. I, you know, I think they could call me the shepherd, actually, but never mind. They call me, they call me the sheep. And then again, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a piece of excrement. So this kind of stuff comes into my email inbox on a daily basis. Um, I get handwritten letters sometimes, uh, and certainly plenty of abuse 
on Twitter, as do my PhD students, actually. Some of my DPhil students uh, have had even worse abuse than me. Um, okay, so let's now talk about something slightly different. Uh, you can see perhaps how I sort of fell into this highly politicized, highly sort of ideological um, sort of pit. I, I never wanted, I was never looking for this. So here's the Great Barrington Declaration. You may well have heard of this. There are three professors in this picture, who all of whom were flown to Great Barrington, some, somewhere in America. Uh, you can see it looks rather nice, doesn't it? Um, uh, and one of these professors is from Harvard, one's from Stanford, one's from Oxford. They were flown out at great expense uh, and they signed a declaration with great aplomb. Uh, the declaration said this, that COVID isn't as bad as it's claimed, especially for the healthy under 60s. No, they're very interested in the economically active population who uh, implicitly have more rights than everybody else. The evidence base, they say, for interfering with people's lives is weak, uh, and the economy should be prioritized over further lockdown. So they polarize the economy versus public health. So very libertarian, but using three professors from, from highly respected institutions to put that agenda across. Um, I was involved in a counter declaration. I wasn't too comfortable with this because I, you know, I, it's not what I do really, but I was asked to, to sign up to this. And we produced something called the John Snow Memorandum, which said very, in very succinctly, actually, it's a couple of paragraphs. Look, COVID's serious. It can kill you and all citizens count, not just the economically active. We said that the best way to save the economy is to address public health. And we also said, as citizens, we need to make compromises for the good of society. So it was really just, um, look, this is the situation we're in now. This has been politicized. Uh, we are also from prestigious universities uh, and actually these guys are not going to corner the market in terms of the truth. This argument and the things that led up to it uh, was picked up by the British Medical Journal and they depicted us as being from two camps. So we've immediately been depicted by uh, not just the mainstream media, but also the medical media as uh, polarised. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember getting a phone call from my mother saying, well, who should we believe then if it's, if it's he said, she said, um, surely the answer must be halfway in between. And so that whole business of both sides journalism uh, becomes very, very problematic, uh, which is why sometimes I will say, no, I'm not going on television to talk about this because it, it then creates this false, um, false idea of balance. Um, the investigative journalists got involved, they investigated me, they didn't find anything, they investigated others and uh, claimed to have found um, fringe pseudoscience um, in uh, other professors that, that had signed uh, a previous letter prior to the Great Barrington Declaration. It's important to say Carl Hennigan did not sign the Great Barrington Declaration, um, but certainly they were accused of being involved with uh, government advisors who sought to downplay the death toll from COVID uh, for their own political and ideological reasons. And it was also dug out that some of these scientists, although they were Oxford professors, had actually never published in a peer reviewed journal uh, the kind of claims that they were making. Now, as you can imagine, I started getting interested in the uh, relationship between politics and science since I'd been caught up in it. Uh, and there were two papers that really inspired me. The first one was this one by Martin McKee, who you may know. Uh, David Stuckler was also at Oxford for, for a while. I think he's now gone to America. So their argument in, in this top paper was that uh, there are many people on the libertarian right who are anti-masks, anti-lockdown, pro-segmentation so the argument is if you're old uh, and vulnerable in any way you should stay at home in order to keep out the way and let let others um, enjoy their freedom uh, and the whole herd immunity argument let the virus roll over the population uh, and then the population will become immune the second paper the, the bottom paper on this slide uh, was by jason harson he observed and gives quite a lot of evidence here that the proponents of this 
a particular argument tend to be, although they are not necessarily white and male, they tend to be aggressively confident and hierarchical. He gives some really quite striking examples of that, particularly the pastors in churches in America who get up and say, you know, if you wear a mask, it's anti-God and all this kind of thing. And they're also dismissive of traditionally female traits, such as emotionality, in other words, caring about this, uh, such as uh, any kind of power sharing, any admission of uncertainty, um, anything uh, that's even vaguely circumspect. Uh, so there's very interesting social science literature that is emerging around uh, this particular position. It's not a million miles away from post-truth. Post-truth uh, came out a few years ago as a term uh, defined as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. There was, in fact, uh, an online conference called COVID-19 and the Post-Truth Age um, in June 2020, and Roy Shulman summarised it uh, in this, this lovely quote here. He said, the COVID pandemic is a unique phenomenon constituting the most blatant expression of dangers of the post-truth age. The period of the pandemic, he said, has been characterized by less confidence in institutions, a lack of agreement on facts, and a blurring of the line between opinion and fact. The pandemic, he said, it intensified the need of citizens to find certainty, but they tended to find it in comfortable facts from institutions and entities they regard as trustworthy and that are consistent with opinions they already espouse. So this is a tough kind of environment to be doing science in. Um, I think it would, would be over-egging the pudding to, to draw too many parallels with the work of Hannah Arendt. Um, but actually some of the stuff I've been through is um, resonates a bit with this last bit in this quote from Men in Dark Times, under the pretext of upholding old truths, they degrade all truth to meaningless triviality. So let me summarise. COVID-19, it's been an extraordinary year, hasn't it, 2020? Research has progressed at unprecedented pace. Um, too little knowledge quickly became too much. Zero research on COVID-19 quickly became 200,000 papers. Facts, or at least some of them, uh, were continually contested and became saturated with ideology. Uncertainty became a weapon to be used tactically by interest groups. Uh, and Scientists themselves, our, our flawed assumptions, our political allegiances, our interpersonal rivalries, even our private lives, became the story, even when we didn't want it to be. So what do we do about all this? I mean, you know, because it's not just me, as I say, it's also my team, my DPhil students, and people come to me and say, Trish, what should I do about it? You seem to be surviving it. So here's four approaches that I have found help. Um, the first one I've called reflexivity. Um, some of those of you who know Port Meadow will know that, that this is the River Thames. It's very close to my house, actually. I was out there swimming in it today because it's a nice sunny day in a wetsuit, of course, but this is summer. Um, I used to go very early in the morning, so 5.30 or 6 in the morning uh, and sit there uh, as the dawn broke uh, and go for a swim and have a good hour where I would sit and just have a bit of headspace. I do that almost every day. It's very, very rare that I miss that and it's really important. Um, and just think about what's going on, consolidate the things that have happened, make sense. Um, secondly, not nearly as much fun, painful engagement. I have to read what people write about me. Maybe I don't read every word, but I really have to get the gist of what it is I'm being accused of uh, and who else I'm being uh, associated with in, in, in other people's uh, minds and, and, and their allegations. But here's something else, epistemological labor. And what I mean by that is working 
to not just present empirical findings, but to look theoretically and philosophically at the assumptions underpinning the claims of uh, other scientists, and indeed my own claims. Um, this hierarchy of evidence deserves to be toppled sometimes. Now I say that as a cancer survivor, I say that as somebody who wouldn't be alive without randomized controlled trials. So I'm, I'm, I, I've written many books about evidence-based medicine. I'm not opposed to it in principle, but I am opposed to its um, over application and inappropriate application. So actually writing papers that question the philosophical underpinnings of this hierarchy are very, very important uh, uh, things that we can do. Now, funnily enough, I've just been commissioned by Nature uh, to write a paper on this very subject. So I'm, I'm gonna be doing that uh, this month. Uh, and finally, deconstruction. That, uh, as I've said to you, um, and I hope I've, I've presented something like the Great Barrington Declaration, picks a few scientific facts, uh, and I'll have facts in inverted commas there. It is certainly something that, that some people would say is based on truth, is there's some truth in it, but mixed up with all sorts of ideological claims and other stuff. And we need to deconstruct what exactly are the scientific claims here, but also what are the, what are the values, what are the political claims, what are the ideological claims, uh, and take those apart. It is exhausting to do that compared to the straightforward science that I was doing a year ago. This is, this is tough. This is the toughest stuff I've ever done in my life. But deconstruction is also very, very important. So for example, if we were going to deconstruct uh, the science of masks, we need to ask what counts as facts and, and how do those facts become legitimate? We could look at masks as PPE, personal protective equipment, and we could test them like a drug in randomized controlled trials, and we'd need our population intervention, comparator outcome, all that kind of thing. But we could also ask other questions. We could identify masks as a political issue. They're linked to controversial choices, those contracts for PPE supply, hidden vested interests, all that kind of thing. And for that second question, uh, a randomized controlled trial isn't necessarily going to help us. And so we have to sort of be aware that there are more than one, there's more than one way of looking at masks uh, scientifically. Um, there's also the social and political science of masks. Um, we were asked to write an article for The Guardian a few weeks ago uh, about the Great Barrington Declaration. And what they wanted us to do was, was uh, actually argue against the scientific claims. And we said, no, no, we're not going to do that. We said, it is transparently bad science. It's such bad science. We're not even going to waste our time uh, with that. But what we are going to ask is who is funding it? Uh, where did the airfares come from, from the scientists who were flown over? Um, who's, you know, who's paying who uh, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and we did in fact find, guess what, a, a, a very generously funded libertarian think tank uh, and other people actually, other, you know, full-time investigative journalists are taking this question forward. I've just given you some examples on this slide of the kind of um, papers I've been writing, which I would classify as epistemological labor. Um, you know, what counts, uh, why is this so-called systematic review so much better than a, than a narrative review? Uh, we've taken that one apart. Uh, we've taken apart the notion of complexity and what kinds of research uh, are appropriate to look in complex systems. Uh, we've taken, in the top right, I wrote a, a piece uh, for Public Library of Science called Will COVID-19 Be Evidence-Based Medicine's Nemesis? To, to say that, hang on a minute, this was a 20th century approach. We're now in a 21st century setting and it's no longer appropriate. So lots of provocative stuff there. And I'm no doubt you'll have lots of comments and I hope you'll, have, you'll be able to disagree with me so we can have a good argument uh, in the last 20 minutes of this talk. Uh, so thanks very much. I'll now see if I can work out how to unshare my screen uh, and I'm available for questions. Thank you so much Trish, that was um, absolutely fascinating um, and I'm not surprised you go wild swimming at, in Port Meadow actually after that kind of abuse you've received, goodness me. Um, 
so we have got uh, some questions that have been pre-submitted. Um, the first of which, do you think the hierarchy of evidence can be harmful at times in delaying decision making in a public health context? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we wrote the piece uh, which was published at the beginning of April is that already back in March, people were saying, let's quickly do a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and I think the, this sort of expectation um, that there is a truth out there and if only you did a really careful, really carefully controlled experiment, that truth will appear. Um, actually, that did delay and is still delaying um, decisions that I think could save lives. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, as health professionals, how do we best engage with combating misinformation on social media? That's really, yeah, good question. Um, do you know, the first thing I do is I don't take personal responsibility for everything that gets posted on Twitter or Facebook or any of the other things, you know, that it, it, it's like walking into a pub and uh, hearing someone in the corner talking rubbish. You don't go and correct them. You know, there's rubbish on social media. Okay. Um, so that's the first thing. And there has to be some self-protective mechanisms uh, for people who, like me, have quite a high profile on social media. I've got more than 100,000 followers. Um, I block people. I block people who abuse me. Uh, I block people uh, very quickly who abuse my students and my staff. Um, but there is also a very positive um, role of social media um, I put together research collaborations. We got quite a lot of research money through uh, collaborations that were made primarily through social media. But also, of course, one has a platform because it's not just that uh, I've got a lot of followers. It's, it's who those followers are. They, I have a lot of members of parliament. I have members of um, Congress in America following me. I have leading public health experts. And, you know, I follow them too. So it's actually a pretty good way of getting messages out very quickly. Uh, and I think one of the things that you, that you need to do if you want to use social media to, uh, you know, in a, in a positive way to convey science, uh, you've got to be the kind of person that posts stuff that is useful. Uh, so even if it's not useful to me, if I come across something that I think my followers would want, then I'll post it and I'll summarize it. Uh, and that's what gets you more followers that, you know, you follow people who give you useful stuff. Uh, so it's a kind of curating thing. But I would also say, uh, don't do too much grief. Don't beat yourself up if someone's rude to you on social media. I mean, you usually find they've got 12 followers and, and you know, they're a bit sad, actually. Extremely true, yeah. <laughs> Um, the next question we've had in, are there enough people in our political class and our civil service with a sufficient level of scientific education to guide this country in the 21st century? Yeah, really interesting one, isn't it? I mean, I really, I, I, I really am quite keen on the whole notion of the complex system. And, um, you know, people say, well, should, should the scientists be driving the boat? Should the politicians be driving the boat? Surely we, the citizens, should be driving the boat. Look, the whole point is it's, it, it's a complex system. We need everybody. We need political leaders. We need policymakers. It's no good just having the academics in charge because that's been tried before and we screwed it up badly. Um, you know, the, the policymakers are better than we are at making policy, if you know what I mean. So um, I think it's more important to think about the relationships between these sectors and between the people in those sectors than it is to think, who do we need? I mean, yes, of course, we need people with scientific training, but it, I would say also we need people with humanities training. I mean, Martha Nussbaum wrote a lovely book. Um, what was it called? Not for profit. Why democracy needs the humanities. Where, the reason why we're where we are, I think, is partly that it's gone out of fashion to care about people. It's gone out of fashion to kind of have um, a real moral commitment to society. Uh, and I'm actually more worried about the the the. Uh, lack of humanities training uh, in, in some areas of government than, than lack of scientific training. I mean, they need to, they need to ask us, they need to ask scientists. 
there's a provocative thing. Um, the next question we've had in, alongside the large numbers of high, quali high quality studies on COVID published as a result of this pandemic, there's been a considerable amount of research waste. Hundreds of small and poorly designed studies have been published which haven't improved policy and practice and have sometimes made things worse. How can journals and researchers be dissuaded from publishing bad science in response to emerging infections? Yeah, I mean, there's all that problem about predatory journals and, and stuff. I'm, it really bothers me that even my master students and sometimes my DPhil students can't spot a rubbish predatory journal when they see it. And you think, how can you think this is proper science? This is just a rubbish journal, you know, you, um, so the, the, the kind of signal to noise ratio has, has gone and that had gone before COVID. Uh, having said that, you know, we, we need to teach people how to spot rubbish. Um, there's, there's, what I was going to say, and I forgot the other thing I was going to say, a really important one. Yeah, at the beginning of COVID, and I was involved very early on, you know, because I was actually liaising with a group of Chinese professors who we were going to bring over to Oxford. And they were seeing, um, you know, in December and January, it was all unfolding. So I was sort of following it then. Um, and there was nothing, there was not a single paper in the academic literature. And when someone published a series of 100 patients who were admitted to their local hospital, and this was what was on the x-rays, and this was the blood test results, you can look back and say, oh, that was just really biased sample, and it was right, but hang on a minute, it was a hell of a lot better than nothing at the time. The problem is that in good faith, every hospital in the known universe did the same thing. And that's why we had so many of these tiny little um, descriptive studies. But right at the beginning, I wrote a piece for the BMJ about how to assess um, acute breathlessness. And the only data we had was from some hospital in Wuhan. But you know, that paper ended up with a quarter of a million downloads because it was all the, there was. And even with all the caveats, it was still better than nothing. Um, so I think we have to be a little bit careful about talking, you know, criticizing the, the clinicians and the scientists who were really doing their best. Um, having said that, I do think we need a clear out um, of a lot of the rubbish which is still circulating and still influencing practice. It's, it's about time someone went in there and cleared it out now, which the Cochrane Collaboration are trying to do, you know. Um. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, is it possible or even desirable to draw boundaries about what's considered expert opinion and what role is there for those experts in improving public understanding and trust in the available evidence? That's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because, of course, one of the problems with things like the Great Barrington Declaration is that the people who are fronting it are considered to be experts. And I would say that those scientists are not bad scientists. You know, that, I mean, people talk about them being equivalent to Andrew Wakefield. I don't think they are. Andrew Wakefield really was a bad scientist. Um, and I'd say that to his face and have done. I think the scientists who fronted the Great Barrington Declaration are a kind of extreme end of a range of scientific opinion. And I think personally, I think they're also a little bit politically naive. Um, but I don't think they are motivated I don't think they're motivated by evil motives. Uh, so anyway, the question about expertise is, of course, one person's expert is, is another person's misguided uh, and narrow scientist. So a good example of that is you could say, well, expert opinion is a systematic review. But, you know, we've been arguing, saying, wait a minute, a systematic review um, if you remember the bilingual parrot slide, the systematic review is making a number of value-based claims while pretending to make no value-based claims. Uh, so you could say, well, minute, maybe you're not the expert. I thought you were. And I think one of the things that the COVID pandemic has really raised is we can question and we should question people's claims to expertise. What does that actually mean? Um, there's lots of different kinds of expertise. So I'm not really one, I mean, I know I, I was persuaded to go on that database of experts. I think just about any Oxford professor 
you know, you get that thing from whoever runs the database of experts and you have to say what you're an expert in. Well, that's all very well, but I bet there's someone on there who's, who's claiming, who's, who's saying the opposite to me, who also thinks they're an expert in the same subject. You know, that's just, that's just scholarship, isn't it? Had a direct message in actually. Uh, great lecture and leadership, thanks. Do obvious things like don't put your hand in fire, it will get burned, or covering your mouth to, to minimize spread of respiratory disease. Uh, really need immediate EBM, or shouldn't it be more obvious, stroke easy for people to appreciate? And does it show the power of propaganda over facts? And hence, should we be doing a better job of that rather than agonizing over the EBM? I certainly think we should be looking much more broadly than um, what does EBM mean? Does it mean I've got a unique claim to truth? No, it doesn't mean that. You know, it's really good for dexamethasone, but it doesn't mean that anybody who's evidence based gets to override anybody who's not evidence based. You know, that that kind of thing. And I think your questioner saying we really need to communicate better. We need to communicate better with the public. Well, hang on a minute, there's whole departments of universities on communications studies. Um, and actually, you know, I wrote a book called How to Implement Evidence-Based Healthcare, and there's a whole, there's a whole chapter on, on communication. It's not something we teach most scientists. We're getting better. But actually, I'll tell you one other thing, is the, the challenges of communicating science up until the end of 2019 were that nobody was interested in our science. And so if you actually got your press release onto the front of the Daily Telegraph, you were doing really well. Uh, whereas now the um, problem is the opposite, is that as soon as you've posted your preprint or given a talk, you're all over 20 newspapers and you've got Piers Morgan on the phone saying, will you be on my G, what is it, GMB tomorrow morning? Um, in other words, the, the media are all over us and it's not just me. And so communication has changed. It's not just how can you get a slot on primetime TV? It's, well, hang on a minute. How can you turn one down when, when it's not the subject you want to talk about? Or how can you handle it when you find yourself being pitted against uh, some other scientist that you didn't know was going to be invited on in this kind of false war that they've constructed for viewer entertainment. It's those kind of things. So it's a very different communications uh, than the last time I went on the comms course, for example. Thanks, uh, Trish. We've uh, one more question here. Have you completely lost faith in politicians who don't respect experts? How can scientists best promote good policymaking? Uh, I never really had any faith in politicians who don't respect experts. Um, but I would say that it is more important than ever to build relationships with politicians and policymakers. So this is something that I've been encouraging my staff to do for a long time. Uh, one of my roles in the Department of Primary Care is um, I'm, I'm the lead on research impact and I actually got the HR policies changed so that it's now a criterion for promotion that you've got relationships with policy makers um, and also that junior researchers and, and DPhil students are not penalized for spending time building those relationships. So I had a, a young uh, early career researcher who said to me, I went along to a briefing breakfast at the King's Fund and I was told off by my line manager for wasting time. I should have been writing high impact uh, journal articles. Uh, and so I took that as a critical event. And I, I said, right, in your PDR, your professional development review, there's now going to be a box where your line manager has to ask you whether you built any relationships with not, not just policymakers, actually also industry, also the third sector, also, um, you know, talks to schools, all that kind of thing. So academics putting themselves about and networking and building relationships has always been a really important way of getting our research out there. But also it means, uh, and for example, I mean, one of my uh, big research interests is um, video consulting by doctors. I've been looking at that for 10 years. Uh, and 
at the beginning of March when it became clear that we were going to have to do a lot of consultations by phone and video, I was contacted by NHS England, uh, by the chair of a committee that I already sat on saying, will you help us get something called total triage up and running? Uh, we've got 10 days to do it. And we worked literally day and night to get those policies written. But the, but the point I'm making here is the only reason why I was involved in that and why my research was able to influence it was I already had existing relationships with those policymakers and they were on, we were on first name terms already. And there was a lot of trust between us uh, so we could do it. So I think it's, it's not just about who they asked on one occasion, it's much more to do with the ongoing relationship and the quality of the relationship that you've got with your, uh, you know, the people in Whitehall, frankly. Okay, thanks. Um, as a historian of medicine who's collaborated with scientists on a nature paper, I was going to ask about the role of interdisciplinary collaboration as part of the epistemological labour you've talked about. I'm so glad to hear you emphasise the importance of the humanities. How to increase this collaboration on a system level? Oh, it's really, really hard, isn't it? I mean, I, let me just give a plug to the Wellcome Trust. The Wellcome Art, they really get it because probably Sir Henry Wellcome got it and he put it in the statutes. But I have been very fortunate in um, a major tranche of my funding has come from social science and humanities uh, streams at the Wellcome. I would say they've just turned me down for another one, but never mind. They've, they've you know, I've had my share from them. Um, I... I'm absolutely passionate about interdisciplinary research because, um, and I define interdisciplinary research um, as if you're sitting around a table in the days when we used to be allowed to do that with other researchers and you are not feeling really frustrated that other people are not seeing things the way you see the world, then you're not doing interdisciplinary research. The point about interdisciplinary research is that everybody doing it is taken slightly outside their comfort zone uh, by having to listen to and engage with the perspective of someone who thinks differently, who sees the world differently. Um, we've just uh, had a, just submitted a paper today, actually. Um, we had an intern who is from um, languages, modern languages, well, not that modern, but she did a defil in um, Russian literature in the 19th century, but she did it on intertextuality. And I'm really interested in intertextuality. Uh, and she was looking at how newspaper articles about this remote GP consulting had influenced other newspaper articles. So she used that intertextuality skill uh, to, to look at what was going on in the Daily Mail and all that kind of thing. Um, and we'd just written a paper for the Journal of Medical Humanities which massively took me out of my comfort zone because I just didn't think of things the way she looked at them. Um, but we argued and we just, you know, I think we've done something really quite original uh, and it was huge fun. That was the other thing. So the research unit that I run is called interdisciplinary research in health sciences. Uh, and we have philosophers, we have an anthropologist, we have psychologists, we have computer scientists. Um, we have got a health economist, um, doctors, nurses, and, and the point about it is we are reflexively interdisciplinary um, and I just think we do things that are a lot more original as a result of that. There's other people who think we're rubbish, but hey, that's all right. <laughs> that's a very interesting point. Um, I, I'm afraid we've sort of practically at four o'clock now, um, so I don't think we're going to have time to put any more questions to you. So I'm really sorry if, if we've, we've run out of time. But I um, just want to say a huge thanks, Trish. That was really fascinating, really powerful. Um, and I'm sure everyone's um, found it an incredibly useful and insightful lecture. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, we so this is the last in this term's uh, lecture series however we are finalizing details for next term and uh, you'll all receive notifications in your inbox ways to register 
So this is the last we'll see of you before the Christmas break. So I just want to wish you all, it's a bit early, but a, a very, very happy um, holiday and I hope we all get some rest and, and some great news and here's to a much better 2021. Thank you all for joining us.